Thank you very much, Sami. Good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here. I have plenty of equations, so no. Uh, it's robotics, body intelligence, and control. My affiliation is with the University of Pisa, but also with the Instituto Italiano of Technology in, uh, in Genova. And uh, uh, so the, if, if we look back at the time uh, when we were students, uh, we had uh, robots that had an intelligence that was uh, you know, a big cabinet, but very little intelligence inside. And, and today, the, in 2020, the intelligence that is in a, in a cell phone is uh, roughly six million times more than that. And this has changed things. Uh, impressively. And of course now we, we have computers that beat humans at uh, chess, but also at Go. What has been happening in robotics? Well, this is robotics a uh, few years ago. Still there is this in, in, in industry. Uh, plenty of robots separated from humans, very few humans around. There is one here, one there. Uh, because of safety concerns, but this is not what is uh, today. Actually, things have been happening in robotics, and uh, here is to robotics today, as you probably uh, all know. This is collaborative robotics. Now we have people in touch with robots. And the good news, if you do look at this picture, is that these robots are all made in Europe. And this is not chance. We had, uh, uh, you know, research in Europe in the last 15 years that have led to results such as collaborative robotics, industry 4.0, so on and so forth, is basically European-centric. Uh, in part, this is due to the fact that uh, there was a good funding from the uh, European Union and from the national states. And we believed that robotics and machine intelligence was important, and I think that we should do uh, this more. This is one of the contributions to this project. To this, to this development. This was a, a project in 2004, it was called Friends. And in, in the Friends in here were uh, DLR, Alin, and Sami as a young student, uh, Kuka, Laas, Jean-Paul, and, and his colleagues, Rome, Alessandro De Luca, Naples, Bruno Siciliano, and ourselves. And here is a picture of Alessandro De Luca explaining the method of residuals uh, to Sami at that time. This must be 2005, I think, or six. And Sami really took on these lessons. And he was trusting science and technology in Alessandro De Luca, really. And, uh, that made a change. So, but the new challenges are, you know, go beyond that. And of course, we need robotics that will help us uh, with the uh, aging of the population. Our own aging, we are probably the first generation that will have robotic help and disasters. For these things, we need robotics that can get into the world. We need intelligence that has legs and arms to act in the world. So that, that, that is what we need, machine intelligence. How are we doing that? Well, this is not really encouraging. If you compare the performance of a human body with a robot body, it's still not very good. But this is a few years ago. We are making progress here, too. Let's see why this situation is happening. Is it because of the motors or because of the tiny details? No, really, if you look at the uh, electrical motors that we use in some of these robots, they're not bad. They're not that bad if you compare with human muscles. Uh, power efficiency, power density are comparable or even better. But when you put them together, the transportation cost of a robot is 10 times higher than human. And the mass payload ratio is 10 times worse. So there is something that is not just in the details, but it, in the system building, in the understanding. So these machines need intelligence, need more, better building. So here is a, a little uh, exercise that I would like as, to, to ask you. So assume that uh, you want to define intelligence. And to do this, you, you do this construction. You start with a neuron. You assume or pretend that we understand as an, uh, how a neuron works. And then also assume that we can build a computational model of this neuron, and we can put it in a computer. And then we can get ambitious and say, OK, now I build many of these, and I build a copy of the brain. 
Of course, to do a copy of the brain, you want to basically define intelligence, replicate intelligence, make an artificial copy of intelligence. So you copy the brain, and of course, the brain has many different parts, visual, auditory, motor sensory, prefrontal, but also the inner parts of the, of the brain are very important. The thalamus, the cerebellum, all the parts that control uh, motion and, uh, and the uh, autonomic system of the body. Down to the brain stem, where all the information, or most of the information, comes to the brain. And if you took of the, uh, think of the brain stem and you want to simulate this, you have to also simulate what is coming to the brain stem, which is the spine. And all the peripheral nervous system that talk to the spine, and you have to build a model of this. And then you go down, down the, 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 the leaves, and what you find out is that in the skin itself, the receptors of the skin, that are many under our skin, already do some pre-computation of the data of the contact that you have. So it's really impossible to stop building a model of the brain unless <coughs> you do a model of the whole body. And this is what I, what I say. I mean, intelligence is in the whole body, my argument for this. Of course, this is trivial to some. Uh, uh, philosophers have a name, and they call it embodied intelligence, and it, was, it goes back to Anaxagoras in the 6th century before Christ, so that a human was the most intelligent of animals because he had hands. It was the body that made the intelligence, not the other way around. And hands are indeed very close to my heart as a researcher because they really are uh, where you see uh, intelligence of the body at work. So here is a long history of robotic hands, but still the, per, the, the ability of the human hand is unmatched today. Uh, why is that? The hand is very complicated in many senses. It's a very you know, wonderful system, but we control it very simply, very naturally. And that's the wonder that I've been always been enthused with. Um, so what can we do to improve a little bit the situation with, with robotic hands for, for the real world? First of all, there is mathematics, there are models. I have removed the whole equations here, but the point is that um, there are methods for defining the statistics of how we move hands and to organize the complexity of these hands in geometric methods. So you can define a geometry of subspaces that organize the complexity of hands. And you can um, see how the hand would move according to this geometric model. What happens is that if you imagine of grasping uh, in a very simple real task with such a geometric model of the hand, well, it wouldn't probably work. Why? Because a rigid model of the hand moving geometrically wouldn't find the correct shape for grasping, not even a simple object as a sphere in this case. It wouldn't match the two geometric model wouldn't match unless you prepare them beforehand. Not, wouldn't work in any real case. But then back to embodied intelligence, this is, this is the, how the bodies are made. The natural bodies are soft. And if we observe this and we exploit this besides mathematics, uh, then we have a solution. Of course, not only the human body is soft, the whole natural kingdom is soft. Going from the uh, you know, very, very early uh, animals here to the invertebrates or the vertebrates later on in evolution. And uh, robotics has been picking up this idea. Uh, here is, for instance, the invertebrates generated the continuums of robots, and Cecilia will give a presentation later on on this uh, uh, very nice device. Uh, vertebrates uh, produce articulated soft robots where you have you know, article, uh, where you have uh, bo bones uh, or rigid parts together, but you see the performance that softness can give to robots. Now, this is what has changed, but why is softness? Let me give you my perspective why softness is important. So go back to this picture. Geometrical model, mathematical problem uh, model, not sufficient to explain or generate models of grasping, a very fundamental task in humans. But what humans do? Here is an experiment with a person grasping an object that is not there. It's a hologram. So we created a hologram and we tricked the person to you know, pretend to grasp it. And, and see what he does. He goes inside. 
So the model that is, control, that is controlled in the hand uses this geometric model, probably in, somewhere in the brain, I wouldn't dare where, but uh, say where, but is controlled in the hand. But the brain already knows in some sense that he will not exactly put his hand in the right place, but the object will uh, somehow resist to this mismatch and generate those grasping forces that we need. So we count on both the geometry and the softness of the system to generate our grasps. And this is what led us to design the synergy theory and the soft robotics, the geometry and, and the material uh, theory to, gener to, to produce this PISA IT soft hand that is a hand that is uh, uh, at the same time the most anthropomorphic hand that we have around, I think. It has 19 joints, it really moves like a human hand. It is compliant. Uh, on the other hand, it's also the simplest because it has one soft synergy and one single control. Uh, by putting these things together, the hand can do interesting things. Here are a few operations where the hand uh, is uh, used in an uh, environment, uh, industry-like environment. And you see the hand that uh, is controlled by this single synergy, the single motor, but has the possibility of adapting to the environment so that you uh, observe interesting motions. I think I can put some some of the music up. You see how it uh, uh, shapes it itself around the object, showing some intelligence in the way it grasps. So the programming of the hand is very simple. And what is interesting, I think, is this uh, uh, operation that is uh, next. This is not very relevant to industrial applications, maybe in the uh, off time, but it's interesting to see how the hand exploits the softness to do something that would not be compatible with a pure geometrical model of the hand. Here are two hands that are used on two uh, Franca robots, and uh, a person uh, simply teaches the robot what to do. And you can see that, uh, in this case, the task that uh, could be uh, a task that could be considered very difficult by opening a box, taking a box up tilting, putting the ball in, in a hand, and then opening the other, the other box, putting the box in the other, and then shaking the other box. It's something that was not seen uh, a few years ago. I think it's interesting to see uh, how this anthropomorphism of the hand allows the person to program it very naturally. Uh, there is another application that I like, uh, that I'm really proud of, of the hand, which is uh, prosthetics. And here is the hand that is used by uh, uh, a person, uh, she is Maria, she is actually a collaborator of our group, she has a PhD in uh, design and she's part of the group in the sense that she designs, she does the design of the hand. And she is uh, showing here the hand that has 20 kilograms of force that uh, can be used in uh, normal life. This is the prosthetic version, of course it's uh, different uh, but the same principle as the industrial version. And you see here how the, the hand naturally shapes according to the object shape, what is required by the task. It's also delicate because of the softness principle. accurate enough, soft, and very interestingly, the softness of robotics allow robotics to be naturally in contact with the human, so it's comfortably used by the person touching her own body or touching the body of others in an interaction that would not be conceivable if you had a, a metallic hook or, or hand. You know, playing volleyball with the hand. 
Uh, this is the new version uh, of the hand that now has a more uh, human-like look. You see here on, on this patient, these are more recent videos, not completely edited. Uh, and here is the hand that is used uh, by uh, patients in uh, Medicine-ish uh, school in Hanover, uh, in a project that we have together with Sami and, and others. Um, where the new hand is uh, shown to, you know, in operations that would not be possible with other, with other devices that were not inspired by this uh, principle of soft synergy. Here is Maria that participated in the Cybertron. So you see again the new hand uh, in tasks that were done recently here in uh, Munich, I think. I'm not sure where, uh, where, uh, uh, where the Cybertron was this year. So we did very well. We participated in three of the four days, and we always won. And here is Maria with the new hand. I like this picture because she's, you know, now these pictures are taken offline, and she didn't know. So very naturally interacting with the hand. I love this one where she was really unaware and using the hand as, you know, a real part of her body. Uh, here she is dancing, a very nice personality trying to teach dancing an engineer, which is a desperate case, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so um, with this, uh, I, I will uh, stop talking about the hands, but I wanted to bring another topic here. Um, uh, that is uh, the, the use of uh, AI and robotics. It's not just, uh, not just this. So this is uh, interesting for maybe. Um, you know that robo race, uh, I mean, driving cars in, 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 in the traffic is very difficult, but driving, tra driving cars in a uh, more controlled environment is, uh, is possible now. Uh, uh, this is a competition, uh, robo race, that is a Formula E cars with robo drivers, complete AI drivers. And uh, uh, here is the car, the dev bot, uh, the, the development uh, car, that has 215 kilometers per hour. Here is the Tazio, our AI driver, Danilo Caporale in our group uh, uh, participated in this robo race uh, at very first year this year. And uh, the interesting thing is that we were, uh, the, the two teams that were in the finals this year uh, where uh, this is the, the new car that will be racing this year, later on this year. Uh, the maximum velocity is uh, a little bit more, 250 kilometers per hour. It's quite a challenge to drive uh, such a thing with a computer program. Uh, and here is the competition, the finals. So it was Technical University of Munich and University of Pisa in the finals. And you see that we are leading, eh? you see, look, Pisa is ahead. <laughs> now, um, yeah, you see a few, a few, a few turns, and it's clearly they're doing better. Then, then I think uh, at some point it's interesting. Yeah. At some point, I think we made a little mistake, uh, and, and, and the rest I don't ship. <laughs> <laughs> so, good luck uh, to, to you, uh, MSRM, and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>